Zach Nagy, Sports Illustrated. Good evening, good sir. How are you? How we doing, baby? We're back. We are back, like, but not like Texas. Yet, not yet. I'm not giving them that. I'm not giving them that moniker yet, just because they beat Alabama. I'm not ready for that either. So we're on the same page. Zach, what you got? I'm I'm a little nervous for this weekend. A little, mm-hmm. a little. You know, like, and let me tell you why. Because I know that Tulane stopped this team running the football. I know Alabama did, and to some extent, so did Georgia Tech. Man, if this front seven can't get after this team in this running game, then we got really big issues. Yeah, I agree with that. And my thing with this was kind of like you, you saw the front seven make an impact and cause commotion inside, but it's kind of just, you know, getting home. They're not getting right. the blood, Wrapping up, not whiffing. And I feel like we're on the same page on that front. But, you know, Quinshawn Judkins is a freak, if we're going to be honest here. I mean, that Ole Miss back is, is incredible. And just because he's struggling – you know, to start the season doesn't mean he can't snap back in the blink of an eye and cut up on Saturday. I mean, it's a primetime game in Oxford. You got LSU in town. It's There's there's no reason for him not to do his own thing. But, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have a good one coming up this weekend. I'm, I'm extremely excited to see what Oxford brings – or what Ole Miss brings to the table. What do you think they do bring to the table? What do you I think, think they're going to have I mean, I think Lane Kiffin's an absolute mastermind of an offensive coach. And, you know, people can, you know, say what they want about him, say what they want about me saying that. Um, but at the end of the day, he's an exceptional coach, and he, he's going to look to exploit that secondary as best he can. Jackson Dart, you know, isn't the most talented quarterback in the SEC, but he has his fair share of weapons. He has his red zone threat that he likes. And at the end of the day, you just are going to have to make sure he doesn't exploit the secondary to the best of his abilities because Lane Kiffin's going to try to do that, especially with a struggling secondary that LSU has. Well, and they're a wounded dog. You know, so there's two sides of this coin. Right. In reference to Ole Miss is a wounded dog coming into this, right? Like, they still have everything in front of them to play for, Zach. Like, they're not out of this by any stretch of the imagination. Now, can they win it? I don't think so. But, that does, you know, that doesn't matter what I think. Hashtag the rock. But I look at LSU. You won a game where you thought a team was wounded that came in there and gave you everything that they had, and you won. So... Does this team come out maybe a little bit more focused than they did last week in the first half? If you're referring to LSU, then... Yeah, I I mean LSU, correct. My goodness gracious, I hope so, because that was a really weak start to the game. I mean, I was talking the other day about Jaden Daniels, and you you could kind of sit here and say that that was his worst start to a game in his LSU career. What did he go, 7-14 of to start the game? He had a pick, missed throws, missed reads, under throws. It it was a a struggle for Jaden Daniels, and I'm a Jaden Daniels advocate. I believe that you know, he's going to continue getting his stuff together because he showcased, you know, the ability to shake back against Arkansas. But, you know, for the most part, yeah, you have to come out of this game or come out of that locker room shot out of a cannon because Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin are not messing around. So you, you got to come out of this game hot or else it's going to get scary quick. Zach, I, I'm going to I'm going to make a I'm going to give a statement here and I want to see if you agree. Now, don't if you don't if you don't like don't go down my little rabbit hole here if you don't if you're not no, I got you I got you I think that this next two weeks are the biggest two weeks that LSU has all year I don't I don't fear going into T-Town okay Florida can run the football sounds cute Graham Grant I mean you're gonna have to keep up with Jaden now I know that yeah. their defenses look good so far they have some dudes whatever okay I'll see you in a couple of weeks Auburn can't throw a vertical pass a and Max Johnson and Baton Rouge, he ain't winning. I'm just going to tell you, LSU can go fight, lose every game. They're going to beat A&M and Death Valley and Baton Rouge, I promise you. Yeah. These next two weeks, Missouri's got Vandy this week. They're going to be 5-0, and 11 a.m. Como. You're going into Vaughn Hemingway at night. I don't – I think it's the biggest two weeks that you – toughest two-week stretch you might have because it's on the road. It doesn't work well when that happens. And you can beat these teams at home. You can beat Florida, Auburn uh, uh, at home. You can beat A&M at home. I'm not worried about them. I think this could be a massive two weeks that LSU fans need to gear up for. I don't disagree with that at all. I, I think this this Ole Miss offense is something to reckon with. This weekend is going to be tough. Primetime game in Oxford. You can't really ask for much more. You know that fan base is going to bring it. You know Kiffin's going to bring it. Jackson Dart's going to try to do, you know, he's going to try to compete to the best of his ability. I'm excited for the Mizzou game, man. I'm excited to see what Missouri brings to the table. 
I'm a big fan of Luther Burden. I, I think he's an extremely talented wide receiver. Who, he's an all SEC caliber guy. And, you know, he came to, he, he came to college as this coveted recruit, you know, top five, just prospect in the nation. He took it by storm. So yeah, you're, they're going to look to exploit the secondary once again. And these next two weeks are big for the program, but it's also big to see what you're dealing with in the secondary. Are you going to give LaTerrence Welch a chance? I heard you talking about it a minute ago. Are you going to keep rolling with Deuce Chestnut, Denver Harris, Alexander? Are you going to shake some things up? What are you going to do in that regard? Because it's a big two-week stretch for the secondary, man. Yes, for the program, it's significant. But you're going to see the secondary get put to the test. And how will they respond is, is what I'm kind of circling and looking at over the next couple of weeks. Why do you think that LaTerrence Welsh hasn't played? It's an interesting question. And obviously, you know, we don't have access to practice during the season. So I, we don't really know necessarily what's happening behind closed doors. But it's intriguing for me to not see him be on the field just because at that spring game he cut up and he was tremendous. If there were two or three breakout guys that, you know, you saw during that game, LaTerrence Welch was circled as one of those guys who was emerging. And then something happened. He stalled. And this program hasn't even given him a shot this season to do, you know, what he does. And it, it's been kind of intriguing just because of how much of a struggle the secondary has been. So, you know, something must be happening behind closed doors. Maybe he's not advancing you as quickly as they want not to. Something up. I mean, it's not a talent thing. I've seen LaTerrence Welch shine. The talent is not a problem. I don't know if it's a Matt House scheme thing. He loves to throw different looks around. But something's going on where they're not really giving Welch a chance. And it's very interesting to me. I'll keep using that word because I'm not quite sure why. Whit Weeks was a guy that the media got to talk to yesterday. Sunshine. Man, he's a beast, dude. He's a beast. I'm a huge fan of him. Anybody who gets the chance to talk to him, he's lighting up. He's smiling. He's eager. He wants to learn. He's he happy to, to be here, everybody. man. Wait, what? He's just happy to be here. Dude, he is just an eager go-getter. and to, be, to talk to him was phenomenal. He gave us a couple fantastic quotes the other day. But, man, he he's something, dude. I, I love Whit Weeks. Love him on the field, of course. Love him off the field. Class act. True freshman. He's going to be around for the next couple of years, dude. You got a beast in that kid. That, that's somebody who's going to burst onto the scene and, and keep doing it because he shined in weeks three and four. It's only a matter of time until he keeps on hitting that next year. If Omar Spates is healthy, which he was not, I, I, you know. He's battling that hip flexor injury. That's, that's a tricky one. Well, and he was battling it against Florida State. I got that one kind of confirmed. So, look, I, I mean, I was told that he was playing like 65, 70% at max uh, against Florida State. With him now being back a little bit in the fold with Whit Weeks, do you think we see anything intriguing here? Do you think we see a, a wrinkle with some of these guys? I mean, is there going to be something that we're just, you know, like, hey, man, they found something with this with Omar coming back? I'm just really intrigued to see how these rotations work out, which is obviously what you're hinting at. Because, you know, Omar's the savvy vet. He's the guy who's been there, done that, and obviously playing at 60%, 70% is not going to cut it in SEC ball. It's just not. You're playing against the best of the best on a weekly on a weekly basis. And you have something in Whit Weeks. This is a guy who's emerging. He's only going to get better with more playing time under his belt, more snaps, more reps. And he was really complimentary of somebody like Greg Penn III. He was saying if he was kind of confused and unsure of what was going on, he'd look to his brother on the side and talk to – and his brother being Greg Penn. And, of course, he has his brother West Week as, as well. But yeah, you gotta I mean, he's sitting there. Brother from another mother. Yeah, yeah he's I'm talking to his call. boys, talking to his teammates, and they're helping him out. So – is something kind of brewing in that linebacker room at that second level, man? Time will tell. This week's going to answer that question. But, man, you got Omar. You got Harold. You got Greg. You got the Weeks brothers, man. You got something coming in a big way at that second level. And it was kind of a position group where we were looking at during fall camp, like, what's going to happen here? There's not a lot of bodies. They didn't go to the transfer portal and kind of do what we thought maybe they would yeah, do. Yeah, you what they had in Whit Weeks, maybe. And Whit Weeks kind of emerged as this dog that we were hoping he would become. And he wasn't this coveted prospect. You know, he was this three-star guy. He wasn't this highly coveted guy. He was well-respected. And in-state Georgia was going after him like a, like hell. I'll put it that way. Um, but LSU beat him out, got the job done. And, man, he's shining, dude. He's going to hit that next year soon. He, he's a dog, man. Um, The only thing that I'm looking for, or not uh, uh, personnel-wise, at this point, you are what you are offensively. Look, Lance Hurd didn't play last week. Nobody said anything. Yeah. You notice how that was? It's nobody a, it's a, it's a, nobody mm -hmm. said a word Monday about Lance Hurd not playing. Well, you know why he didn't play? Because Miles Frazier was kicking ass and taking names. He was okay? kicking ass. And don't sleep on that Arkansas the, you know, defensive line. That defensive front is nothing to you know shy away from. Yeah, he, he, made Jeff Coat, he made Jeff Coat look like uh, – look, 
Jeff is a, is a third, well, is it third or fourth round pick, and he was on that ass. No yeah. your balls, but he was on him all. So yeah. he, it's funny how on Monday nobody asked about Lance Hurd. Look, Which when Miles Frazier's cooking, Miles Frazier's cooking, and you're not going to sit there and, and kind of like talk about what if or what they should have done when you have an offensive line that was handling business to a degree. And I was I was extremely pleased with Frazier. You know, there's a lot of people talking. There's a lot of chatter. And for him to go into the field in Death Valley and the SEC home opener and, you know, handle business, hey, man, do what you got to do. It was impressive. You know what personnel change? The only personnel change I'm looking for to see if they do anything? 99. Now, me and you talked – when we were at practice during the, uh, I don't want to, off-season camp, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And we talked when we were on the sidelines together. Hey, man, I know Mason Smith's Mason Smith, but 99 has been kicking their ass all day long. And we're talking about this offensive line who has not been bad. He wasn't going against Miles Frazier. He was going against... 66 and 50 he even yeah. though he was that big of a dude like they put him out there to test him a little bit in camp man you gotta start 99 i'm sorry wow. at some point you're gonna have to start him and get him in there he's been that disruptive he's been the talk of the town i mean he, he's been doing some extremely extremely impressive things and do you put him it's just it's an interesting thing what you do from a I, schematic look, standpoint i start him you know like look are we I'm not saying sit Mason. I'm not saying sit anybody. I think there's a role for Mason Smith on this team. No, clearly he's one of the no best doubt. players there. I don't know? even. I don't even want to go down that path because we've just seen so many people bad mouthing Mason Smith right now, and it's 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 tough because you see somebody like Jordan who is shining, and you don't know what to do from a scheme perspective. But dude, well, you kind of do. Well, let me, I don't know what you got. Get his ass in there. Take somebody out. I don't care who it is. Wingo. I, I don't care what you got to do. I, I, with all due respect, I, I mean, he took up a double team. So on the on the Andre Sam interception, yep, he's beautiful. the one that's generating beautiful pressure. call on your part. Keep going. So and then you had the second worst throw of KJ Jefferson's night, the Greg yep. Penn RPO tap pass. Okay, the only reason that that is happening is because he's now got to step up in the pocket and his throwing lane is off. And Greg Penn almost comes down with a pick. These are two pass play, pass rushes that he had that he affected everything. Oh, and by the way, he Makai Wingo needs to take that man to supper club because he's the reason that he got the sack. I don't disagree with that at all. And I think that's a really good film breakdown from your perspective. I love Andre Sam, by the way. I'm going to throw that out there before I even hint the defensive line stuff. But, <laughs> dude. He's causing commotion down low, and I'm, I'm loving everything that he's bringing to the table. You're going to have to figure out a way to keep him on the field, whether it's starting, giving him significant snaps. Something's got to change, you know, from a schematic standpoint to keep him on the field because, my goodness gracious, he, he's doing some damn good things inside. And, you know, you got Mason Smith as a weapon who's going to cause some some havoc sooner rather than later. Makai Wingo is putting together quietly an all-SEC caliber season. So you're going to do something. I don't know what you do, but you have to keep them on the field at the same time because – especially it's against a team like this. You get to Jackson Dart, you keep that run game in check, this week's going to be a big test, and a lot of questions are going to be answered for, through the first half, in my opinion. Well, and here's, an, here's another thing. If you're, I know that this might not make a massive pass rush difference, but if you're not going to send Perkins any damn way, yeah, then you know who I want? Jones, Jefferson, Smith, and um, – Wingo. Wingo. Mm -hmm. If you're putting Wingo out on the edge to bull rush a tackle any damn way, right? Like, you're already doing it. You yeah. can, Don't give me the excuse that you can't find the four in that rotation. I don't, if you're not going to send Park – now, if you're going to send Park, you're going to put him on the edge, that's a completely different beast. But if you're going to let Makai Wingo be your main pass rusher on third down, then my goodness gracious, you better get someone who's wreaking havoc. Dude, I mean, you're just seeing so many weapons emerge at this defensive line. We haven't even sat here and talked about Deshaun Womack. Like, we haven't even brought up his name yet. You're seeing so many guys kind of burst onto the scene sooner rather than later. And like you said, kind of sticking on what you're saying right there, if you're not going to utilize Harold Perkins as an edge rusher, then you go with that front five kind of rotation that you're speaking with right there, put Jordan Jefferson in there and rock out with that because you have so much talent. It's almost kind of like an embarrassment of riches that you're dealing with here. And if you're not going to use Harold Perkins as this edge rusher, 
then you might as well change up the scheme and do with what you got because you got some dogs ready to, you know, kind of break out of their shell. Jordan Jefferson's, Jefferson's one of them. And, you know, I kind of want to see what Deshaun Womack can bring to the table. It's not done yet. He still has time to get to that next level. But, you know, you got to throw him in the fold eventually and let him get there himself. Look, I know that secondary has gotten the brunt of the – um. Critiques. Critiques. Good. Thank you. It's it's not them for me right now because if it, you've had opportunities to take down quarterbacks, Jeff, yeah. Jefferson and Travis, and you hadn't been able to do it, right? And so when a ball's coming from a different location and a, guy, a quarterback's on the run, the thing with Zy Alexander happens. Right. Okay, like those are the breakdowns. you got to get – I don't care that he blew the coverage as much as I'm mad at that it took us seven seconds to get remotely to Jefferson, right? Like well, that. Matt, just to, to hit on that is really just you can only sit back in coverage for so damn long. Right. Like, there's only so much time you can sit back there. And if you allow somebody of K.J. Jefferson's caliber to, you know, roam around, utilize his legs, and, you know, find somebody on the run, dude, you're in trouble. And, yes, you can point the finger at the secondary all you want. But at the end of the day, you can only cover for so long. And that's why this weekend is a very intriguing matchup for me because Jackson Dart's legs are kind of a characteristic that gets swept under the rug a little bit. He can sit back in the pocket and deliver a pass if he wants to, but he also has the ability to roll out and hit his guys on the run. So this weekend, when I say that there's a lot of things that you're going to see get checked off, one of the things that needs to get checked off is wrapping up, stop whiffing, tackle the quarterback, get him down in the backfield and move from there because whiffing and, you know, half – Half-assing it, we'll just say, half-assing it isn't going to get it done. And right, we saw that against Arkansas. You allowed K.J. Jefferson to do what he can do best, and that can't happen. That can't fly against a Lane Kiffin offense this weekend, man. Braden Swenson's another guy I didn't bring up, you know, who's who's caused some chaos. Got to talk to him yesterday. Uh, well, I'll we might bring that up, but I got, two, I got two more for you. Not to get back to the corner part of this, but – I don't want to, and I don't, I'm not trying to put down on a player, but before Deuce Chestnut goes back out there, which I do think you need to continue to give him chances. Okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying to bench him. I'm not, because he's obviously not in the starting rotation right now. Still give him looks. Hell, let him be a, in, in the slot. See what he can do there. Maybe he can find a home there. He had a touchdown called on him that got called back last week. Can we – I mean, like, when do you abandon that? When do you abandon not give, giving Ashton Stamps a look? Look, your youngsters are only going to improve with repetitions under their belt. And, look, certainly you're entering, an S, you're entering the gauntlet soon of SEC play. Eventually when you're seeing your veteran struggle – so significantly, and I say significantly to be like dramatic, but when you see them struggling, at some point you have to look at your youngsters being Ashton Stamps, even LaTerrence Welch, JV and Tovian. I mean, there's just some, and I know JV and Tovian is a difficult name to put in there. You and I have had our dialogue about that, but at some point you're just going to have to look at somebody like Ashton Stamps and just say, screw it. Let's throw him into the fire and see how he adapts because, you know, he's going to have to do that. He shined during fall camp. You got to get some reps under his belt, and I think you and I are on the same page about that, man. Um. Don't answer the question if it if you don't want to or can or whatever. Were you on the SEC teleconference today? I was for a little bit this morning. What do you? Okay. Oh wait, what are you? Let's see. Pat, Pat Forty. Yeah, that was. I know you were fired up about that, dude. I was pissed. Yeah. I mean, was that not? Did you not feel like that was a little bit of a setup? He was fishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was fishing. Okay, that's yeah. all. I, I just. Wanted to ask some – I don't want to go into detail with it. I've said my piece. I just thought I was crazy because nobody else was tweeting it. I'm like – Oh, no, you were fired up about that. Oh, I was pissed. Yeah. I was I, I was hotter than a spoon in a – you know, in, in a trailer park. Understood. Understood. Right. Brian Kelly's taking a little heat this week in reference to the, uh, the, the – how he managed the clock at the end of the game last week. Am I crazy? That I didn't – I thought he did a good job doing it. What I mean – I played a lot of football in my time, played it at the next level, but mm -hmm. I'd never seen somebody say, hey, he, he kicked a field goal with eight seconds left. I mean, 
am I wrong in thinking that he played that good? Because I thought he did. I don't, I don't know if he played it good necessarily, but it wasn't something that I was sitting back and thinking about, you know, when, when it was A, when it was happening, and B, when it happened, when you won the damn game. You mean, you see these people all over social media questioning his, his what, with Les Miles type beat, where you're seeing how somebody like Les Miles is poor, piss poor, like clock management, you know, throwing comparisons around like that. I'm like, man, I didn't think he played that incorrectly in the slightest. It was well, not a promotion, but man, it was a talk of the town for no reason. So, yeah, I saw that, but. By no means was I sitting back here thinking, like, what the heck's he doing? Because I didn't think that at all in the moment or after. All right. Well, look, I just – sometimes I get in these, like, what I call – I call them seasons, you know. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm just, like, going nuts. You know what I mean? But I'm glad, I, I'm, glad I'm not the only person that <laughs> saw it that way. No, dude, we're on the same page. Trust me. All right. Zach Nagy, you can find him on Twitter at ZNagy20. LSU country underscore FN as well by SI now. Thank you so much, buddy, for joining us. I greatly appreciate it. Appreciate it, my guy. Let's do it again.